Hello, everybody. Um, very warm welcome to today's IID debates event, um, we, where we are looking at addressing the loss and damage um, and exploring actions to respond, recover, and reduce the risk. I'm Juliet, uh, Events Officer IID, and providing some technical support um, for this session. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we are really delighted to have you all here to launch a new report um, and have a hearty discussion with some um, excellent speakers that we've got on the panel. So with that, I'm really pleased to introduce Simon Addison, a Principal Researcher in IIED's Climate Change Group and our moderator for today's discussion. Over to you, Simon. Thank you, Juliet, and welcome to everybody who's joining us um, from around the world. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, or good night for those of you who may be joining from the Pacific. Um, it's really a great thrill to uh, be having this online event today to launch our new working paper on addressing loss and damage, actions to respond, recover, and reduce the risk. Um, this is a product of a year's work of collaborative research with uh, colleagues at uh, ICAD in Bangladesh and others across the global south uh, to generate evidence and insights into how countries and communities can tackle the, the gr grave challenge of loss and damage. Um, that is increasing uh, on a daily basis as a result of uh, anthropogenic global heating. Um, today we're going to have the opportunity to reflect on this challenge and to get some reflections from a distinguished panel of guests and collaborators uh, who are uh, all named on the slide that you can currently see. And uh, we're really looking forward to a, uh, an exciting discussion about this. Uh, we'll also be hearing some of the top line findings of our report um, from uh, the lead authors of chap the different chapters of this of this paper. And uh, there will be a Q&A at the end of the session in which we'd love to hear from you in terms of your feedback, but also to field any questions that you might have so that our panelists can, uh, can, can give you their thoughts and, and insights. With that, I would like to hand over um, directly to the director of the climate change group here at IIED, Claire Sakya, who's going to uh, give her perspective on the research and introduce our keynote speakers. Thanks, Claire. Thanks so much, Simon. Um, it's it's an exciting day. Um, this this research or this this process of bringing all this research and, and thinking together has been one that's been running over the last year. So. Um, it, it really feels like um, uh, it's been slightly more than giving birth to a baby, in fact, in terms of time frame. Um, so it's been it's been a really important process. I think what I've, I found most important is that, you know, loss and damage has been highly contentious in the negotiations. Um, but it is a part of people's reality and it has been for some time, especially those countries in the tropics, but not exclusively. But in the tropics, we've been seeing that poor people are being driven back into poverty by climate events for some time. And in fact, it's in the top three, along with health shocks to the earners, and but also dowries. Um, so we know it's, it's happening. We know that we're not acting on it. And the value of this research is to get practical, put the politics on one side and really aim to understand what can work in tackling loss, loss and damage. And we need to do that because uh, loss and damage is what happens when mitigating emissions is insufficient and when adaptation action has also been insufficient because it's too expensive, it's too difficult, it's socially or politically not feasible. So this research has been aiming through gathering evidence, but also through debating the issues with practitioners, experts from across the world, um, and, and with a strong emphasis on those countries most affected, on the least developed countries and on the small island developing states, to, to really unpack what is it, what are the big issues, what has been effective in tackling loss and damage, and how to finance it. And we hope it'll help government and non-state actors consider how to tackle um, these issues and perhaps even inform the loss, and, um, the loss and damage negotiations. But it has been really aiming to put ourselves in the shoes of those being asked to respond at a country level and say, what do they need to know? And what can we find in terms of evidence and experience that can inform that? So really delighted, first of all, to invite our first keynote speak, speaker, um, Jemima Gordon Duff from the Scottish Government, who's um, a deputy director and, and the lead on loss and damage for the Scottish government. And uh, as we all know, of course, the Scottish government was first came out 
with a really um, exciting and important uh, announcement reflecting on the need for loss and damage finance. So it was really groundbreaking. So delighted to hand over to Jemima, please take the floor. Thank you, Claire, for that great introduction. Um, and I feel like we might know each other from previous uh, work, but we can we can come back to that. It's a small community, isn't it, in the end? Um, so thank you very much, uh, everyone, for, for having me here today and inviting us to this launch. Uh, and thank you to all those who've contributed to the paper, uh, sharing their knowledge and expertise. And as Claire said, uh, on the topic of loss and damage, which is both incredibly important um, and incredibly complex and um, so thank you to IIED and ICAD um, particularly. Um, this year we've seen people around the world confronted by new pressing challenges particularly Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine and the growing cost of living and debt crisis. We're already seeing the impact this is having on the climate debate. Some of you may have seen our first minister when she was in uh, America recently talking about the need to move even more urgently to renewables um, and make the transition away from fossil fuels. And she's been very clear that the climate emergency remains one of the most significant issues facing our world. And I don't know about you, but even where I am in the north of Scotland, the, the record temperatures um, and face it, faced in the UK and Europe were a stark reminder that we are already being impacted by climate change. It's not a future risk, but one we are living through now communities are already suffering losses and damages. So as uh, Claire, I think, already touched on, the, the IPCC reports on mitigation and adaption make it clear we must do more to minimise and avert losses and damages. But they also set out that climate change is already having major impacts around the world. That loss and damage cannot just be minimised or averted, but it must be addressed. And the IPCC reports notes that losses and damages will become increasingly severe in the global south, causing a vicious cascade of climate impacts. So I think it's therefore really welcome that this report focuses on the nature of loss and damages risks affecting low income countries, marginalised groups and people living in poverty in the global south and how they might be addressed. And the report makes a number of recommendations, which I hope is helpful if I take in turn into and look at how the Scottish government um, is, is looking at these. So the report, one of the, the report state recommendations is on the multi-dimensional and compounding nature of loss and damage and how that's impacting different groups differently. With the people least responsible, very often the ones suffering its worst consequences, particularly in the global south, and that we must act now to address this injustice. So this is one our First Minister has spoken on um, in the past about the, the fundamental injustice at the, at the heart of climate change. The report also recommends the need for practical action and prioritising support to those most at risk. And this is one I hope the Scottish Government is clearly demonstrating with our two million commitment, two million pounds, I should say, commitment to addressing loss and damage announced by the First Minister at COP26. So we're already using this to support communities via our £1 million partnership with the Climate Justice Resilience Fund, which I think Heather may talk about later. This work is helping people in Bangladesh address the impact of loss and damage and will soon be supporting people displaced or in the Pacific region. Further funds will go to projects to address losses and damages experienced in Malawi as well as a result of this year's tropical storms. And for all our programmes, we're taking a pragmatic approach in which lived experience must be central. Co-designed intervention with affected people, particularly the young women and other marginalised communities and individuals, is a fundamental tool for building resilience. And that's the approach that should ensure that those most at risk are prioritised. So the Scottish Government grants will help address the needs of communities suffering the acutest impacts while also generating new consideration of how the global community can best support technical measures to address loss and damage by demonstrating or providing an example of what to fund and how. The projects are an important step to improving our understanding, but there remain significant gaps in approaches at a national level, which is why we're pleased to also be supporting 
ICANN's research on integrating losses and damages within national policies and planning frameworks. We hope this is an important step in supporting countries assess their own loss and damage risk. Another uh, recommendation that was in the report. Uh, the, another recommendation is on the taking a layered approach and we know that our programming only scratches the surface with bilateral grants just one of many options for loss and damage financing. But as the paper sets out, we must layer diverse sources and flows of finance. There is no single solution or silver bullet when it comes to loss and damage. Limiting loss and damage to a single funding route will be insufficient if we hope to close the finance gap and prevent the burden falling on the most vulnerable. So as the report states, our global response must be layered, coordinated and complementary. We welcome the exploration by others into alternative options such as innovative um, finance mechanisms, including insurance and solidarity funds. And while work on loss and damage must not detract from the urgent work that is also needed on adaptation and mitigation, funds for loss and damage must be additional to existing climate finance. So I'm going to finish just to let you know a little bit about our future plans, which I hope is helpful. So as a, as a relatively new actor to what is a long-standing issue, we don't have the answers, but the Scottish government is committed to keeping loss and damage on the international agenda and bridging these discussions, which is why we'll be hosting an international conference on loss and damage in the autumn, which the first minister announced um, during the bond discussions. It will be a space to convene countries, regions and organisations to share lessons learned and best practice, including at the state and regional level. There will be an opportunity to collectively develop strategies and action plans to address loss and damage risks that layer complementary measures, such as humanitarian, social protection, early warning systems or planned relocation. But recognising that existing measures are not sufficient on their own to cover the breadth of loss and damage. The conference will, we hope, feed into other global discussions on loss and damage. As we look ahead to COP27, which is taking place on a continent profoundly familiar with the impacts of climate change, it is clear that loss and damage will be a major focus of the discussion there. At that summit, Developed countries will need to step up and show much greater commitment on multiple challenges, including loss and damage. Meanwhile, for the Scottish Government, our focus will remain on the practical action that can chart a path for transformative finance. Showcasing steps already taken to address loss and damage enables us to make the case for the feasibility of action and drive forward global ambition. And just to note that we aren't the only ones who have provided funding on loss and damage. So we have the, the government of Wallonia um, have also uh, provided funding. So thank you very much for inviting me to give the opening address to this event and for organising th this today. I look forward to hearing more on the findings and the recommendations for actions. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Jemima. That was um, that was a brilliant overview and really exciting that your thinking and the recommendations of the report are so aligned. It seems like um, um, oh, it seems perfect that you're responding already. Um, so very exciting indeed. Um, so now I'd just like to introduce Heather McGray, who's been um, from the Climate Justice Resilience Fund, who's been a huge ally in this work already um, in the thinking about loss and damage um, over the last year. And, um, and lending her, her um, very astute and wise um, words in the dialogues, the deliberative dialogues that we ran. So um, uh, Heather, delighted that you're also collaborating with the Scottish Government and, and welcome you to also um, make, um, open us with some wise words here as well. Thanks. Thank you, Claire, and apologies, everyone. <laughs> um, I direct a, a philanthropic, predominantly in phil philanthropic called the Climate Justice Resilience Fund. That means we mostly work with private foundations. We, we pool funding um, from, from places like the Oak Foundation and the Candida Fund and others. Um, we were set up uh, five years ago to create a, a fund that really puts people at the center of climate action. And um, that was quite novel at the time, I think. Uh, I think funding is moving in a good direction, actually, with respect to that core aspiration of ours. 
We primarily pool funding from um, philanthropic sources, from private foundations. And we support work by women and youth and indigenous peoples, um, really supporting their efforts from the ground up to build solutions for climate resilience and build voice and power around those solutions. I met Jemima's colleagues in Scotland a couple of years ago because Scotland also has a climate justice fund. And um, we as climate justice funds were, were part of a very small sisterhood at the time and um, uh, started talking about ways that we could be quite um, an honor that, that we were able to move that collaboration in a direction that is supporting Scotland's aspirations to really elevate the conversation around loss and damage and to demonstrate what it looks like to fund loss and damage and to do justice to the tremendous injustice that loss and damage represents. Um, so we are the, the space where the first million pounds of the Scottish funding is being deployed. As Jemima mentioned, we've already made grants um, in Bangladesh, building on work CDRF has done with, with several people on this call in the past. Um, as an example, you know, we support IPSA, Young Power and Social Action, a, a Bangladeshi NGO, to um, work with community teams, very small scale volunteer teams and communities that are contending with climate force displacement. And those teams are developing methods for identifying how to panel from Scotland of figuring out who in their community most needs which interventions. Um, and this is often rebuilding and relocating homes um, on the coast of Bangladesh. This is some of what our partners there are working on. Um, another example is in the Pacific um, where uh, uh, our pa partners UUSC are coordinating a, a big regional NGO coalition um, that's comprised of, of national uh, organizations and national coalitions of grassroots organizations, organizations who are working in similar ways to IPSA. They're, they're sending youth out to assess loss and damage at a community scale and facilitate conversations with communities to understand what does that loss and damage really mean? And what does it, um, what does it, need in terms of a response at a very local level. Again, this is, this is very significant losses and damages. This is losses of people's homes. It is loss of livelihood. It is ancestral burial grounds that um, are, are getting taken over by the ocean. Um, this, is, um, this is not simple. And um, we are so honored to, to be able to play a role in supporting the community members who are figuring out how to tackle these, uh, these not simple challenges. Um, you know, as Jemima did, I'll, I'll speak a little bit about where we're going next as CJRF. Uh, at the moment, we've deployed about a half of a million pounds from Scotland that sits with us, and we are working um, to identify partners in Malawi uh, so that we'll have an example grant there in, um, in Africa. Uh, as noted, there's you know, been a very unusual storms uh, off the, the southeast coast of Africa over the, the last few years. And communities are getting hit not once, but multiple times. Um, and this, this pattern that's new with climate change causes new patterns of loss and damage and causes more challenges in, in recovering and, and coming back from those losses and damages. This idea of layering initiatives that, that comes up in the IID paper is, is one that resonates very much with us and our experience that there's not one solution in these contexts. There's a need for um, support for communities from a range of different policies, a range of different actors, and figuring out how to have those in place quickly, soon, uh, so that, that we don't let all of this loss and damage grow. Um, uh, so that, that Malawi grant is coming. We're, we're also working on pioneering some um, participatory methods around deploying some of this funding, of, of building a participatory board um, that can bring expertise from the ground level, from the community level, all the way to the global level to make decisions around uh, how, how should this funding go. 
um, so that some of that local wisdom is relevant at, at other layers of, of this, this loss and damage process. I also wanted to speak briefly about philanthropy. Um, one of the, the huge successes of the Scottish commitment um, to CGRF at the COP last year was that several private foundations stepped forward to support the efforts to create a loss and damage facility. Those foundations um, actually are not pulling their funding with us at CGRF. They are supporting um, COP activist uh, activism through some other mechanisms. And, and they're working with the Climate Vulnerable Forum um, um, to um, build out uh, a loss and damage initiative within their fund as well. Um, so, so we're just really delighted that, that this has enabled a, a kind of the support of an alliance at the global level of a number of different um, funding opportunities and for channeling that knowledge and experience that we're able to support at the ground level into the activism and advocacy um, at the global level. Um, so uh, the next step is, Jemima mentioned the, Scot the, the Scotland's hosting a conference that I think will be a really important stepping stone uh, to the next COP. Um, we're also working with our partners to make sure that early lessons from our grants are available and are communicable uh, at a number of different scales. Um, and uh, we want to you know, further explore some of what's explored in this IID paper of identifying what is really needed and what are the most powerful and impactful and participatory uh, and equitable mechanisms for deciding how loss and damage funding is deployed, how we move it very quickly and how we accelerate momentum around um, this, this agenda uh, in a way that really supports people. So I, um, I look forward to further discussion on this and thank you to everyone. Thank you so much, Heather and, and Jemima. Really wonderful to hear from you about um, you know, more, more detail about the, the kind of pioneering effort that the Scottish Government and CGRF are, are taking together to really mobilise action on the ground to address these multidimensional risks. And, and great to hear that some of the findings have, of our paper have resonated um, with you in, in that practical action that you're taking. We are now going to move into the, the next phase of this event, and we will be uh, hearing from several of the authors who have contributed to the paper, and they will be presenting a very brief snapshot of some of the top line findings, given the time we only have uh, about four or five minutes from, from each of the authors to summarize what are really rich uh, and uh, informative chapters. And so I will be uh, quickly passing over to my uh, uh, colleague Ritu Bharadwaj, who's going to tell you a little bit about the approach that we took in doing this research that has resulted in this paper. Ritu. Thank you so much, Simon, and a warm namaste, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you. Uh, to, so just to quickly start off um, this, this discussion around the key findings, I'll just quickly talk about the process and the purpose behind this research. And the purpose behind this research was to catalyze deeper collective understanding of loss and damage risk and the possible solutions around it. And when we started off this research, we were clear about one thing, that the real experts in loss and damage are the people and practitioners who are already anticipating, hoping, managing, and supporting recovery from climate impacts causing loss and damage. So along with ICAD and IID, we therefore adopted uh, both a top-down as well as a bottom-up approach to research, consultation, and evidence gener generation. Uh, with a view to co-develop pathways to tackling climate change loss and damage. And for this, we adopted a three-pronged approach, and I'll quickly talk, through, talk you through them. The first approach was deliberative dialogue process, which Claire also talked about. So we organized a series of five deliberative dialogues before and after COP with a range of stakeholders from these developed countries, small island development states, NGOs, civil societies, and other actors from vulnerable developing countries to unpack the issues and co-create solutions to some of the critical questions facing loss and damage discourse, such as what are the realities of climate change loss and damage? 
And what should we consider in responding to it? What kind of action and support are needed to tackling loss and damage? How can we deliver those uh, action and support and how it can be financed? So we were looking at some of these critical questions and trying to unpack solutions around them through the series of deliberative dialogue. And along with coming out responses to these questions, these deliberative dialogue also help in creating, so creating a, a space for vulnerable countries to share issues and challenges they were facing on loss and damage and communicate their priorities for action. Creating a common platform for diverse stakeholders to have concrete deliberations on appropriate policies needed and how to deliver them on the ground and contribute to changing that narrative for urgency to act on loss and damage now and the need for practical solutions. The second approach that we took uh, under this research was to generate local level evidence by providing an opportunity to the NGOs, the civil societies, the universities and experts from Global South to tell their stories, provide evidence on the challenges that they are facing and illustrate the practical responses and the support needed to address those uh, in, in whatever context they were facing those uh, impacts in. And for this, we created a South-South capacity building and a mentoring approach. Uh, and each of those authors were then paired with mentors to support self-learning. And these stories were then published in the form of case study compendium on loss and damage, from which we drew a lot of evidence for this research paper uh, that we're sharing uh, today. And the whole process and approach helped in establishing an approach for generating local level evidence and knowledge, setting a process for South-South collaborative learning, support and experience sharing on climate change, loss and damage issues, and co-generating compelling evidence from diverse contexts to raise priority of loss and damage. Uh, along with these two, we also established a strategic advisor and friends group comprising of loss and damage experts, opinion makers and development actors and academicians to guide the whole research process. And this group met at least five, four times last year and provided recommendations and inputs on the framing and the issues to be covered in the deliberative dialogue and the wider research. And they really added a huge value to this whole research work by providing strategic direction and guidance and acting as a critical sounding board in relation to the overall strategy and approach for this research. Uh, and they also helped in bringing the knowledge from different domains of expertise to raise the ambition and to accelerate action on tackling loss and damage. And along with these uh, bottom-up approaches, we also complemented them with the use of structured review of data and analysis in the existing literature, consultations with experts, and LDC uh, advocacy experts uh, working on loss and damage issues. So, you know, the whole uh, purpose behind explaining this process is to explain to you as to where we have brought this research into this, this paper. Uh, and along with this whole process of research, we also had a lot of co-benefit that was created uh, as part of this whole process. So back to you, Simon. Thank you very much, Ritu. Um, the first uh, part of our paper covers, uh, 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 gives a brief overview of the history of loss and damage as it's been addressed within the international arena with a particular focus on looking at the UNF triple C negotiations and the way that that's um, developed over the years. Partly we uh, took a look at that in order to ground this um, analysis, but also to um, argue that given the political um, let's say challenges around achieving consensus on the issue of loss and damage um, to, to make the case that there is a, a pragmatic approach that can be taken that grounded in these concrete realities. And I just want to, um, to note the uh, contribution of our colleague Camilla Moore, who works in the, the, climate, uh, the, the climate change groups uh, ambition team, which supports, supports the LDC negotiators in the UNFCCC. And Camilla uh, is our lead support to, to them on loss and damage and really brought uh, an incredible um, uh, clear analysis of, of how this uh, issue is being dealt there. So just wanted to acknowledge her contribution. That chapter then leads into a quite detailed analysis of how we are understanding the challenge of 
loss and damage, both in terms of the impacts of loss and damage that, that happen increasingly every day, but also as they're you know, affecting people um, of uh, different, uh, uh, different places along the scale of intersectionality and vulnerability and risk. And, and how those change over time. And I'll pass over to Anna Carthy, who was the lead author for our chapters on the loss and damage risks issue. Thanks, Simon. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Anna. I'm a researcher in IAD's Climate Change Group. And as Simon said, I'm going to talk about chapters three and four of our paper, which look at the nature of loss and damage risks. So the risk of experiencing loss and damage is made up of several factors, hazards, exposure, vulnerability, and of course, the limits to adaptation. We don't have time right now for me to delve into them all. So I'll just very briefly mention a few key things that I've discussed in the paper on vulnerability. So vulnerability to loss and damage is intersectional and intersectionality describes how multiple and different axes for oppression interact to jointly shape human experience. So these axes can include gender, race, caste, age, sexual orientation, and disability. So narrow approaches to understanding loss and damage tend to consider people who experience loss and damage as a homogenous group, calling them simply vulnerable people and ignoring these intersectional differences. But it's really the long-term structural conditions that produce vulnerability to loss and damage along intersectional lines. So we focus in this chapter on how vulnerability results from political marginalization and on the need to address the structural root causes of vulnerability. Um, we also in this chapter ask the question of whose responsibility is loss and damage. So there's a common theme in the way that most global North countries frame this question. Instead of accepting responsibility for causing climate change through historical emissions or for creating and reproducing vulnerability in many global South countries through processes of colonization, imperialism, resource exploitation, structural adjustment and debt, they often shift responsibility to global South countries themselves by suggesting that populations' vulnerabilities result from their own institutions and development pathways. So this all serves to justify rich countries' avoidance of the question of liability. So while this paper focuses on what affected countries of the Global South can do to address loss and damage practice, this does not imply that the responsibility for dealing with loss and damage is theirs. Loss and damage is fundamentally an issue of climate injustice, and there's an urgent need for countries of the global north that have caused climate change to accept and act upon the responsibility to support those in the global south who are experiencing mm -hmm. um, So I'll move on to chapter four, um, which is the next slide, please, Juliet. Um, and in chapter four, we identified seven key features of loss and damage risk and what implications they have for taking action to address loss and damage. So I'm going to briefly run through the seven features and then pass along to Nora. So the first key feature is that climate hazards are unprecedented. And this means that loss and losses and damages can't be addressed solely on the basis of our knowledge of past trends. Action should be based on robust assessments of potential climate risks across a range of possible futures. Feature two speaks to the dynamic nature of loss and damage. It is happening now and it's escalating over time. So it must be addressed urgently. So effective action must be based on regular risk assessments that involve affected communities. Feature number three emphasizes that loss and damage risks can't be viewed in isolation from each other. Climate hazards are increasingly occurring either at the same time or in close succession, and this can cause cascading losses and damages as recovery from one shock might not even be completed before the next one hits. So actions to address losses and damages must be ratcheted up over time to tackle these compounding impacts. The paper discusses feature number four um, about marginalized groups being disproportionately affected with relation to intersectionality, gender, racism, and disability. And it concludes that action to address loss and damage must prioritize marginalized people in the global south and also ensure that support is delivered in an equitable way. Feature five discusses how current methods for estimating loss and damage tend to focus only on financial loss and damage. And beyond that, they 
only capture loss and damage incurred by wealthier social groups because they focus on assets, wealth, infrastructure, and GDP. So that approach obscures the losses and damages incurred by marginalized groups, particularly informal sector loss and damage and non-economic loss and damage. So actions must assess losses and damages in terms that matter to the poor and marginalized people and must prioritize the losses of well-being faced by those excluded groups. The sixth feature highlights that efforts to assess loss and damage risks must seek to understand the different risk perceptions of different people. So actions to address loss and damage should, should use bottom-up approaches that are grounded in people's values and in people's lived experiences and account for the power relations that determine whose voices are prioritized in decision-making at the end of the day. And lastly, the seventh and final feature explains that actions to address loss and damage must devolve resources, authority, and agency to the local level. Investment in loss and damage response is obviously needed at all levels, but it must prioritize local leadership by those who understand and have experienced loss and damage. So all of these seven features have implications for how to undertake actions to address loss and damage. And after that extremely brief run through of the seven features, I'll now pass along to Nora. Thanks so much for listening and I look forward to the Q&A. Uh, thank you, Anna. I'm just going to share my screen really quickly, so please bear with me. Uh, great. I'm going to get uh, started, and uh, thank you, Anna, for handing it over to me. So, um, addressing loss and damage. Many solutions already exist that have the potential to address loss and damage effectively. However, no one solution will work to address loss and damage. Climate impacts and risks are increasing in frequency and intensity, compounding, overlapping with each other, leaving residual risk in their wake and interacting with underlying causes of vulnerability. Given this and building off of what Anna just spoke about, addressing loss and damage requires a comprehensive approach that considers the complexity of different risks and the wide range of possible impacts that may occur over the short, medium and long term horizons. So the concept of layering can help tackle this complexity of risk. Layering is when a suite of interventions, rather than a single intervention, but when a suite of interventions that are chosen to tackle both short-term shocks and address risks that will occur over the longer term are implemented in parallel and layered. This approach will not only support vulnerable communities and households to address the range of different climate impacts that they might face over time, but also ensure that the limits to adaptation, that when limits to adaptation are breached, the inadequacy of one measure can be offset by complementary measures. So what might this look like in practice? Very brief example, where limits to adaptation have been reached, measures such as social protection programs can act as social safety nets that allow households to better absorb shock and recover from loss and damage. Interventions such as nature-based solutions and flood proofing can help households manage compounding risks they face, such as flooding. The integration of early warning systems, community-based disaster risk reduction, anticipatory cash transfers, and emergency response and recovery measures around building back better can help households deal with the immediate and residual risks that they face. And planned relocation and livelihood diversification can be initiated when new limits to adaptation are reached resulting in areas perhaps becoming uninhabitable or unsuitable for a particular livelihood. Of course, how any measures implemented and delivered can hugely affect its impact. Measures can be effective, sustainable, and socially impactful if they are implemented in conjunction with certain good practice attributes. I will now go through 10 attributes that we have identified in this paper, and very briefly, uh, one, map multidimensional vulnerability. Uh, vulnerability mapping, which max, maps exposure, sensitivity, and coping capacity, can provide crucial information for decision makers when developing plans and identifying gaps or opportunities in addressing loss and damage. Two, communicate climate risks effectively. Climate risk communication is most effective when it is communicated to those who need the information most in a bottom-up manner made appropriate for the intended audience by removing jargon and translating it into local dialects and packaged with clear advice on what to do and support services that are available. Three, act early before risks become disasters. 
where possible, measures in the suite of interventions must work to promote prevention and preparedness, pre-hazard interventions that actively shift the narrative from reactive emergency management to disaster risk reduction. Four, and very crucial, empower communities to lead local responses. Local and national governments alongside NGOs should consider creating and training community-based disaster management, risk reduction, and emergency response teams. Bringing These communities bring with them locally specific and often innovative knowledge, skills, and solutions with the adequate empowerment, education, financial and technical support communities can lead responses to tackling and addressing loss and damage. Five, ensure measures are based on locally defined priorities of people at risk. If community needs are not considered, it will not only impact long-term sustainability of initiatives, but it can also cause negative social impacts, maladaptation, and additional loss and damage. Participatory processes and approaches are often best placed to assess the loss and damage needs of vulnerable communities. Six, sorry, address underlying causes of vulnerability. Non-climatic drivers can become underlying risk factors. Because of this, in highly exposed or highly vulnerable communities, loss and damage risks are likely to remain no matter what forms of adaptation action are taken. Given this, action should include measures that address chronic drivers of vulnerability, such as poverty, food insecurity, and poor infrastructure. Seven, take a whole of government approach. The issues of climate change are often confined within the remit of specific government agencies or departments that actually work in silos. However, addressing loss and damage requires that climate risk is mainstreamed into all sectors and calls for the collaboration and coordination across ministries and between different levels of government, especially empowering local government. Eight, include the whole of society as well. Effective coordination of planning and action by multiple agencies and organizations is vital. This includes the government, community representatives, CBOs, national and international NGOs, donor and finance providers, the media, and the private sector. Nine, be ecologically sound and harness the role of nature. In an effort to address loss and damage, ecosystems should be left intact and where possible rehabilitated. This is important not only because of communities' reliance upon ecological services and resources, but because nature can, be, can protect communities against climate change impacts. And finally, always account for non-economic forms of loss and damage. Decision makers must ensure that policies and practices not only recognize and address non-economic loss and damage, but support communities in building resilience to avoid such NELs and ensure measures do not incur further loss and damage through non-economic loss and damage. And with that, that's the end of my uh, chapter. And I would like to hand over to Clara virtually um, to conclude with uh, financing. Hello, um, I'm Clara Gallagher. I'm a researcher at IID focusing on climate finance, and I was responsible for writing this uh, final financing chapter of our working paper. So the aims of this chapter then were to draw together different principles or characteristics that should guide loss and damage so that it can respond to the dynamic and broad spectrum of loss and damage impacts and risks. We reviewed six different sources of finance that could be relevant to addressing loss and damage in the absence of a dedicated loss and damage financing facility. And this stems really from the thinking that no single source or flow of finance can provide all of the complex characteristics needed to address loss and damage in, in, all, of its, in all of its forms. We wanted to consider how the complex flows of, of finance from these sources could be layered to address loss and damage. And finally, to draw on some examples of delivery mechanisms that could be used to address uh, loss and damage in different ways and which could channel appropriate types of finance to the people and places that need it most. So, so coming back to this idea of layering financial tools and products, um, throughout the paper, we've said that at different moments of a loss and damage event, different kinds of support are needed to address economic loss and damage, non-economic loss and damage, impacts from slow onset events or from rapid onset events all of which are seeking to prevent the burden of financing falling upon the poorest and most vulnerable and most badly affected households that did least to actually cause climate change. And so rooting all this firmly in, in principles of climate justice. Different responses would, would likely require different types of finance. So taking the example of a rapid onset event like a cyclone, this might require initially anticipatory risk finance before the shock occurs. So that might be index linked insurance or, or social safety net payments to highly vulnerable households. 
These might then need to be followed up by the rapid deployment of emergency response finance after the shock has happened from a pooled fund or a contingency fund. So this is you know, often what we see as this humanitarian finance, which in turn will need to be followed up by long-term support for climate resilient recovery and reconstruction in the form of, of grants or, or even zero interest loans from development finance providers, as well as the delivery of long-term support to address physical and mental traumas and the livelihood needs of survivors through national public services. And this might be funded by the domestic budget process. So to have each of these layers in place and, and able to swing into action at the right moment and reaching the right people is clearly no small task and it's hugely complex. But thinking through these challenges, you know, how to get different flows of finance to work to address loss and damage, how to get the finance to the local level, to those enduring loss and damage, to those about to experience loss and damage, can still be valuable without jeopardizing this long-term goal of new and additional dedicated loss and damage financing. So, so one thing that we were suggesting is that there are existing mechanisms that can carry innovations to make them relevant to supporting action on loss and damage. And in the paper, we look at the Ethiopian Productive Safety Net Programme and devolved delivery mechanisms like the community-driven development approach used in the Philippines Kalahi CID SS Programme. Things like making social protection portable, so you have the ability to take your social protection payments with you, um, would support action on loss and damage by enabling social protection recipients to make choices about leaving an area that might expose them to an upcoming shock. And we also suggest that another approach might be to pool and disperse funds to address loss and damage from a solidarity fund. So this could be held nationally and disperse, um, collect uh, different flows of finance and disperse um, finance of different types for different purposes um, to national and local authorities, you know, or directly to communities, depending on the most appropriate level of subsidiarity for, for whichever implementation, whichever action um, is trying to be implemented um, at the time. The disbursements could be made either through existing delivery mechanisms, such as you know, the social protection schemes I mentioned, community-driven development programs, or, or devolved climate finance mechanisms. And you know, the, the Solidarity Fund is not expected to do every job. Employing the skills to manage its own insurance program or social protection system would, would needlessly duplicate capabilities that are found in other parts of government. Instead, the Solidarity Fund should be designed to support entities across government and across society that already manage relevant delivery mechanisms, but to enable them to become more effective at addressing loss and damage impacts and risks through their work and connecting the appropriate finance layers to each of the interventions needed to address different forms of impact and risk. And also playing that coordinating role for action across actors and across different levels of governance. So, this kind of, of national or subnational fund management could be modelled on the enhanced direct access process that devolves decision making on climate action away from the board of the GCF uh, at the Green Climate Fund and into a national or subnational decision making body to then on grant or on lend or on blend financial products um, to things that they are choosing. These suggestions um, that you know, I've listed for the last few minutes, they're, they're not without significant challenges. And we can clearly see that the volumes of finance to address loss and damage are, are hugely insufficient as they currently stand. And that we are seeing that the standards that different entities are expected to meet in order to access funds directly under climate finance are you know, prohibitively time consuming, uh, resource intensive and, and difficult to do. However, suitable finance to support action to address loss and damage is urgently needed and yet in this chapter we spent some time thinking through different options for supporting financing flows to reach those that need it most um, at the right time and in the right way all supported by principles of climate justice so i'm looking forward to hearing from respondents and, and from you all about how our ideas on layering actions and finance uh, sit and, and using different uh, existing mechanisms or a solidarity friend approach to channel the money to those enduring and addressing loss and damage. So thank you very much. Thank you very much to Clara and all, to, to all of the other authors. Thank you so much for, for giving us those um, insights into the findings of the paper. We're now going to move on to uh, get some responses and some insights from our uh, panel of guests. 
Um, we have a distinguished panel um, of people who are really at the, the forefront of um, thinking and action to address loss and damage. Um, we will hear from uh, Professor Emily Boyd, who's a professor at Lund University in Sweden and also an author of uh, the latest IPCC report that uh, relates to loss and damage. We're also going to hear from Hafiz Khan, who is a, a lawyer in the High Court of Bangladesh, but also a lead uh, negotiator in the Least Developed Countries Group on Loss and Damage and a uh, member of the Warsaw International Mechanisms uh, Executive Committee. From uh, Selim Hook, who is the director of uh, ICAD in Bangladesh and also uh, an advisor to the Climate Vulnerable Forum, amongst many other initiatives looking at loss and damage. And also to Emeline Siale Elolahia, um, otherwise known as Siale, who is the executive director of uh, the um, Pacific Islands Association of NGOs. Um, first, I'd like to uh, invite you, Emily, to give us a, a few thoughts on where you think we are, uh, kind of what's the current state of play based on the research that you've been doing uh, and, and how you think we need to move forward in addressing this, this challenging issue. Thank you so much and uh, thank you and it's good to see everybody here today. Uh, I'll just say a few things. I'm just going to mention something on the IPCC and uh, some gaps that we've identified and then some next steps. So I just wanted to come back to um, the IPCC is obviously, it's not a research project, it's a, a, an assessment of the current state of, of science and understanding. And I think it's really important to go back to that and uh, highlight that um, things that have already come up here today, but really within the context of the IPCC, we see that global warming of 1.1 degree has already caused dangerous uh, and widespread loss and damage. So that's something that's stated in the IPCC. And that's disrupting uh, both communities and billions of people around the world, but also nature and our, our natural environment, uh, despite adaptation efforts. So that's really important to remember. Um, the IPCC identified also that uh, non-economic loss and damage uh, is associated with climate hazards and uh, growing vulnerability. So several chapters, in particular chapter eight on livelihoods and sustainability, identified examples of non-economic loss and damage. And that's things that have come up here today, but aspects of changing culture, loss of way of life, quality of life, effects on mental health, effects on people's livelihood, land agency, and so on. And what's new here is that this is really being articulated in the scientific literature now. So whilst there's obviously uh, many, many, many examples out there of losses and damages of small l &D, um, the scientific community are just starting in the last 10 years to really capture this and start to... Um, really try to figure out what this is. So this is from a scientific perspective. And that, that obviously makes a difference And when it comes to policy in terms of communicating with policy about what the science is finding. And then in terms of the future, that the, uh, you know, the near-term risks uh, of losses and damages are highest for certain groups and communities that are vulnerable around the world particular hotspots and particular areas, for example, along coastal areas and coast, coastlines. Um, but we also see sea level rise, obviously also um, going into the future, uh, affecting uh, progressively making people at risk. And despite mitigation efforts, which is woefully inadequate at the moment, still with mitigation efforts, we're going to see this risk playing out for communities and the most vulnerable communities. So these are things that we say we are obvious, but they have been stated by the IPCC. So we have to take them really seriously and take that forward into policy. So in terms of gaps, um, we also see gaps in terms of identifying practical or practice around uh, losses and damages, particularly non-economic loss and damage at different scales. So your work has started to contribute to that. Uh, and I thought it was really interesting the way that you've um, incorporated new methods to co-creating evidence around these. I think that is really critical and uh, important going forward. 
we still need more evidence on uh, on uh, limits to adaptation, what they are and how they are played out. So documenting evidence going forward, and while it's not enough just to do science, it is still important to have that going along beside action, beside policy, to help support that process. And also to be thinking that we're also documenting this for future generations. So whilst it feels like that's a sad and dystopian to some extent, it's still important to have a record of what's happening for the future. Um, and that then plays into the governance component, the governance of finance, really critical. We see in terms of adaptation constraints, of which we talked about now that, you know, loss and damage is sort of an outcome of the, the failure to adapt sufficiently fast and at scale. Um, there, across uh, regions, governance is one aspect which is a barrier everywhere and finance to some extent. So that's something we can find everywhere. So institutions, policies, constraints there need to be looked at and regulation. So uh, we will come to this, uh, I think with some of my other panelists, but you know, what kind of regulation do we need to connect this into? How does this connect to uh, different kinds of actions, court cases and so on that is, um, that is and will draw on this understanding of loss and damage further. So in terms of going forward then, um, continuing to develop non-economic loss and damage, documenting that, starting with people who are at the forefront of risk, um, measurement and development of measurement, which connects to the evidence, but also governance and, and the kinds of mechanisms that are developing, but what kind of mechanisms need to. And I think there is a need here for capacity building for uh, policy uh, policy community to, to understand this connection between the science and policy here and what loss and damage actually is. So I think I'll leave it at that. Uh, hand over to my fellow panelists to comment further. Thanks. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, I'd like to now invite uh, Siale from Piango to share your experiences in the Pacific and to share the experiences of community members and, and members of your association who are um, confronting the reality of loss and damage now on a, on a daily basis almost. Okay, maybe we can move on to uh, Salim while we await, while we await uh, Siali. Sure, uh, thank you uh, very much, Simon. Apologies for my sore throat. So let me start with a, a personal anecdote. <clears throat> I just spent a few weeks in Europe, uh, first in Bonn attending the UNFCC subsidiary bodies meeting, and then in the UK in London. And the day I left London to fly back to Dhaka was the hottest day ever in the UK. Uh, Heathrow Airport temperature was well over 40 degrees and about 28 other places in the UK had 40 degrees. The IPCC projections for the UK said that would happen in 2050. It happened in July, 2022. Then when I flew across the world to Bangladesh, my flight, uh, which is a Bangladesh Airways, uh, Bangladesh Biman, it lands in Silet in the northeast of the country first because uh, we have mostly Sileti passengers coming from the UK um, and the plane empties out in Silet and then after a short stop comes to Dhaka. But as we were flying over the northeastern part of the country, I saw the remnants of a one in a hundred year flash flood that we had from uh, the neighboring country uh, flowing water at a unti untimely uh, time of the year. Didn't, didn't usually come this fast. And although Bangladesh has a very good uh, record on saving lives from cyclones and, and floods, we can't save livelihoods. We can't save assets. The events still cause devastation and a lot of loss and damage. And millions of people are still homeless, they haven't been able to go back to their homes. <laughs> and so this is just an illustration of the fact that losses and damages attributable to human-induced climate change because the temperature has already gone above 1.1 degrees centigrade due to emissions of greenhouse gases is happening already. And it's a global phenomenon. I can cite cases from other cases from Europe, wildfires, China, heat wave, 
<coughs> all happening at the same time. It's a global phenomenon right now. And so to me, that is an indication of the urgency with which we have to help the victims. To me, the number one priority now is not doing research on what do we mean by loss and damage anymore, but helping the victims, finding them, working with them, and finding a way to assist them. That to me is the, the moral imperative of why we need to engage in this. And there are victims everywhere. And so one of the things that we are trying to do is to develop national capacities to understand the issue, to build on what we already have, because nowhere is a blank sheet. There are already some things happening, maybe very inadequate, but they're there. So how do we build on that? And particularly building on the um, a long history or relatively long history of working at local level with local communities on community-based adaptation and then locally-led adaptation. We have a very good network, still inadequate, but it's still a, a very good network of uh, vulnerable communities at the front lines who have connected with each other, with whom we can now engage and develop, learn from them first, and then learn together with them on what needs to be done. Not tell them what needs to be done. They don't need us to go and tell them. They, we need to learn from them. They are the front line in terms of both suffering the impacts, but also in terms of knowledge on how to deal with those impacts, because they're the ones with the problem and they're the ones who know how to deal with it. And so to me, that becomes a high priority and my center is doing work in Bangladesh. We are working with many different actors, including the government of Bangladesh towards setting up a national mechanism on loss and damage using our own resources. We're not waiting for the rest of the world to come and rescue us. We, we do have our own funds, They're inadequate, but we have something and we can start with that. We did that with adaptation. We will now do that with loss and damage. And we are also reaching out to other least developed countries through the network that we run. It's called the LDC <laughs> Universities Consortium on Climate Change, LUCCC, or LUC for short. And we've already initiated activities with our uh, <clears throat> colleagues, faculty members, young researchers uh, in each of these countries to initially do some scoping on the actions that are already available and in place. And then how do we build on that to make them fit for purpose for a much, much more um, threatening global situation? The one in 100 year flood uh, mentioned in Bangladesh is not going to come uh, 100 years later. It's going to come within another four or five years, and we need to be prepared for that. And so to me, I, I see my <clears throat> clientele uh, as the vulnerable communities and reaching them, talking to them, learning from them, finding ways to connect with them and support them is the highest priority. And I find, I must say, a bit too much emphasis on designing the perfect system uh, at a global level uh, uh, and using all our brain power to do that and answer you know, theoretical questions when the practical is staring us in the face and we're not doing anything about it. And to me, that is really getting our priorities mixed up. Um, if I can just end with a comment on the, uh, the most recent uh, development in the G7 initiated by Germany, something they call the global shield, which is a uh, a development from the previous initiative that they had, they called Insure Resilience, which was an insurance-based scheme. They came to realize after a few years that insurance doesn't work for everybody, and it particularly doesn't work for uh, the poorest. They acknowledge that now. They didn't in the beginning. They thought it was the silver bullet, uh, but they now acknowledge that it isn't, and therefore they need to go beyond insurance, and they have come up with this new name called the Global Shield. I'm not sure exactly what it consists of, but my challenge to them has been, I had an opportunity to speak with them in Bonn, is when is the first euro going to reach a victim of climate change? And they have no answer for that. They are spending all their time designing the perfect uh, foolproof mechanism, and then they'll decide a few countries to start it with. And by the time any victim gets any money, it will be a good 10 years in my prediction. So to me, time is of the essence, and we need to be in emergency mode on anything we do. And the criteria by which anything we do 
gets judged is are we able to help a real victim on the ground? And if we're not able to do that, then uh, I would say we are not doing the right thing and we should rethink what we're doing. Thank you, I'll stop there. Many thanks indeed, Salim. Um, valuable insights and, and a real call to action, which I, I, I really appreciate. Um, what you, you were saying there about the need to get money into the hands of affected community members is something I know that re resonates with Siale. I wonder if Siale is there. Siale, are you there? Hello, Siale. We uh, welcome you. I welcome you to to give your thoughts on the the loss and damage challenge that you're facing uh, in communities across the Pacific, and 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 what you th what you think needs to be done. Thank you, thank you very much, Simon, um, and thank you to my colleagues who have shared uh, this amazing piece uh, of knowledge uh, paper uh, that. Um, you know, acknowledging the those that has put it together uh, and compiling it. I commend the structure of the report, really. Um, although it's uh, how many pages are long, uh, but it's uh, really easy to, to navigate through in terms of uh, um, how it's being structured. Um, I think my, my sharing will, will really be very much from a Pacific civil society perspective. Uh, and I would like just to draw uh, on uh, perhaps a few points. Uh, one is the, the coping mechanisms of our, of our people, of our Pacific people, uh, is one that we have acknowledged, uh, although that, uh, you know, we talk about loss and damages, climate change uh, is no longer something of the future. It's already here and now, and people are living it. Uh, but it's interesting to see uh, that the, uh, the, the spirituality uh, and faith uh, of the Pacific people, and I'm sure it's across the globe uh, in various uh, um, uh, spectrum, uh, is something that we often find that it's not being uh, recognized uh, as part of how we see the coping uh, of our people. We, we have seen uh, that to be very much in terms of how people are related to um, the relationship between uh, their lives and their livelihood and the environment. Uh, and in the Pacific, very much our ocean. Um, and we have uh, also seen uh, the, the, the value-based, and I think that this paper has uh, touched a bit on that, uh, but it's um, really the, the challenges that we face in terms of um, uh, we started to put certain value into our, our natural resources. Uh, and oftentimes it's being used to, um, uh, as part of a, of a negotiating or a part of a, a bargaining um, a system that uh, um, being brought to light of uh, uh, extracting industries. Um, in how we have seen businesses, particularly when it comes to climate change, uh, where the financing of, of, of uh, loss and damages are being uh, also brought in to be part of the conversations where we see, um, you know, development banks, we see, uh, you know, the uh, businesses are being looked at as a financing mechanisms as well. Uh, but then where do we draw the line when it comes to, are they really interested in, in, in you know, uh, exploring um, solutions for loss and damages for our Pacific, or are they really um, interested in more in, in the, um, you know, businesses where very much into the exploring of our natural resources um, logging, um, you know, deep sea mining is a, a huge conversation going on in the Pacific. So those are the, the things that, uh, that we often find that perhaps we need to look into the value-based um, much, a little bit much more into that uh, in terms of how our, our economy and, and, the, and, the, and the model that we use uh, 
um, to define uh, you know, our development. Um, in terms of the anticipatory approaches, uh, much more into the humanitarian, for example, uh, do we have the, the financial capacity uh, to bring that to our communities so they could define what does that look like um, for, their, for their response uh, and their resilience. There's a lot of uh, uh, discussions uh, and, and I'm really glad to see that in the paper uh, uh, around the debt, how does this in the Pacific, for example, is, is um, this quite an issue. The high debt uh, of, our, of our government, um, not just because of uh, the impact of climate change in many um, you know, cyclones and, and so many of the other crises, but also now make it even worse with COVID-19, for example. Uh, and where do we see the financing of loss and damages uh, in, in, in the sense of COVID, uh, where it, uh, you know, um, we need to follow where the money goes uh, to fully understand how does the investment in, in, in providing the solutions for loss and damages. Uh, we are very much in our community in the Pacific. We, we don't fully see that whole accountability mechanisms of holding, um, you know, uh, government uh, in, in countries that are much more um, perhaps contributing to the pollutions of our, of our uh, planet Earth. Uh, and where do we see that accountability in terms of um, providing compensations, uh, which is which is very much uh, you know and I, uh, a topic in the paper that uh, quite interesting for me to to go through in terms of that political uh, dynamics. Uh, but at the same time, if we are not uh, addressing it, uh, it's like that we are we are talking about so many things. Uh, and yet we don't, we still find that it's being contested uh, by those that are much more um, capable of, of paying up. Uh, we have a lot of uh, commitment that we have seen in the humanitarian sector, for example, the uh, grand bargain uh, in terms of uh, supporting localizations um, is still not there. Uh, and then when it comes to uh, the development uh, scale of uh, SDGs. We have uh, seen a lot of our Pacific communities reporting on their voluntary national um, uh, review. Uh, the implementation is still um, very much uh, uh, not progressing well. So where do we see that comparison to how we see loss and damages and the conversation that is being leading uh, and to finish off, I must say uh, that at the global level, we still hear the conversations uh, that the voices of our uh, Pacific people, particularly our civil society in the Pacific, very much absent. And so where do we see the solution developed to address uh, loss and damages without those that are really living the impact of climate change? I'll leave it there, Simon. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Siali. Wonderful to, to hear from you and, and to, for you to note those, those challenges. I think all of them extremely pertinent and, and uh, we, we have uh, tried to address some of them in our paper, but much more work to be done. And thank you for joining us at such a late hour um, from your home in the Pacific. So uh, we will move on uh, quickly now to Hafiz Khan. Um, Hafiz, as, as a member of the loss and damage countries negotiating team and working on loss and damage, but also from your perspective as a, as a researcher and lawyer in Bangladesh, what are you thinking about the, the loss and damage issue at the moment and where we are and, and what action needs to be taken? Uh, thanks, Simon. Uh, uh, good evening from Dhaka, Bangladesh. Uh, colleagues, I do apologize for, for my background noise, which is unavoidable uh, because it's Azan time, prayer time here in Dhaka. So, first of all, I would like to appreciate IID to organize this very much timely debate 
And if we look at the title of the debate, that calls actions to respond, recover, and then reduce the risk related to loss and damage. It itself, the title itself identifies the emergency uh, 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 to take actions on loss and damage. What Dr. Salim was talking about about the emergency actions. I also would like to appreciate the authors of the IID's working paper and their beautiful presentations. Uh, specifically, I, I do see this report is would be very useful due to uh, their um, uh, context uh, specificity, I would say, because this report focused on the vulnerabilities and impacts in particularly least developing countries and the small. Sorry, Hafiz, we 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 keep losing you. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, my internet is really bad today. So. Uh, I was talking about the community participation. So let me brief due to my difficulties. So uh, 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 the IID's working paper also identified the needs to empower the communities so that they can uh, take part in the decision-making process, even in the implement implementation process effectively. Effective community participation it would be very important. Secondly, I would like to suggest that at the local level, we need to take the socio-ecological approach uh, because the um, it, it is the communities, it is the individual, it is the overall society, and and uh, it need, it needs to be um, needs to be taken a broader ecosystem approach. So socio-ecological approach is needed to identify the needs of the communities, ecosystems at the same time to develop the further policy framework. But uh, colleagues, uh, IID working paper can uh, also think about a chapter on the technical assistance and capacity building. That's what I, I miss, I, uh, it is missing here, I think. But in terms of issues, particularly mobilization, particularly to access the um, uh, funds to the vulnerable communities, what uh, Professor Salim was talking, the victims need to get financial technical support. But uh, this working paper highlighted the um, some of the issues like delivery mechanism. Uh, colleagues, I would like to say the uh, sources of finance, that's what we are discussing now more. I think sources are there. There are five financial entities that the unit proposed in now. Uh, also on uh, Paris Agreement, just we need to create a window or a process to access finance for loss and damage. But what is the challenge is to deliver those financial resources to the vulnerable about the delivery mechanism. And that that, that is how also the negotiator from developing vulnerable countries, they are uh, proposing to establish a financial facility. That facility can um, really useful to mobilize the uh, financial resources and, and to provide uh, and to develop further um, delivery processes, how to vulnerable communities can access uh, the fund um, uh, immediately. In terms of uh, financing for loss and damage, proactive response is needed. At the same time, reactive response is needed. Thirdly, the emergency response. To respond to emergencies during any events that might be from slow onset events or from uh, sudden onset events. But that needs to be supported immediately. That can be technical support, that can be financial support. So delivery mechanism is quite important. So, colleague, at the, uh, you are, uh, we know that at this moment, at the global level, we are trying to set up, uh, uh, agree on the institutional structure on Santiago network. That is quite important for the COP27. So um, uh, that needs to be an effective institutional structure so that this network can provide technical assistance, assistance to the vulnerable communities. Second issue is the uh, vulnerable developing countries. What I said, uh, we propose for a financial facility that can uh, mobilize the funding and also can develop financial uh, right financial mechanism to support the um, victims from the loss and damage resulting from climate change. Uh, with that said, uh, very much looking forward to uh, working with the um, uh, academics, uh, also also CSOs and negotiators. We need to build up a, a, a collaborative effort so that we can influence the ongoing policy processes. 
uh, let me leave it there. Uh, thank you for hearing me again. I do apologize for my poor internet connectivity. Thank you so much. No problem at all, Hafiz. Thank you so much. I think we caught most of the important points that, that you've raised there and, and particularly the emphasis you placed on the need for really effective community participation in uh, understanding risk and decision making on, on the actions that need to be taken. In many respects, that is one of the primary kind of recommendations that we are making throughout uh, this paper. And that is that you know, when we look at loss and damage, we really need to acknowledge and take into account the fact that there are very diverse forms of impact, losses and damages themselves, and risks of loss and damage for different groups, and particularly for those marginalized groups and people living in poverty. And that those vulnerabilities to losses and damages are really shaped by their particular context and the intersectional nature of the risks that they face. And, and that we can only really tackle loss and damage and, and deliver responses, support recovery, and deal with those immediate and longer term risks that they face if we take that, that those diverse forms of vulnerability and risk into account. And that needs to, needs to have a locally led community focused approach that in which those vulnerabilities and risks are really taken seriously. There are a number of questions that have been raised in the chat about how we can do that. I think that's still a very open question. One thing that we've been exploring in India with work that Ritu Bharadwaj has been leading um, in relation to social protection there is the importance of bringing together robust uh, science informed data on climate risks with community um, understandings about risk and what is needed to address the risks that they face and bringing those two forms of knowledge together to make robust plans that can help to uh, accommodate and to address uncertainty and uncertainty is really one of the big issues that I think we all need to try and wrestle with when thinking about loss and damage the uncertainty of how climate change is going to impact different groups in complex societies over time, particularly as loss and damages mount and as risks and impacts compound one another. Tackling that uncertainty through a bottom-up approach is, is one of the principal things that, that we're recommending we should, we should uh, try, and, try and tackle. Thank you to everybody who has sent in a question in the q and I'm sorry that we didn't uh, get time to address all of those, but we will take a look at them. Um, thank you to all of our panelists who have provided uh, fascinating and, and, and really rich insights into this loss and damage challenge and, and how we can take practical action to address it. Thanks for raising some of the gaps um, that we need to be thinking about in terms of research and evidence generation and policy. Thanks also to, to Jemima and Heather for, for your um, insightful keynote presentations and of course to the whole IIED team for your inputs into this paper and for your for your presentations. I'd like to thank everybody who's participated from around the world and uh, I wish you a good morning, good afternoon, good evening and good night and hope to see you all again very soon. Goodbye.